freebies are starting to come in. So I'm going to go ahead and get started because I want to learn and grow with you today. And we are so excited. I am tremendously excited uh, to be here today with you and feel very privileged. Uh, last spring, prior to my arrival, uh, the Office of the President uh, initiated, I think, uh, a concept of proposals to share inspirational stories and research and experiences for members of the college community. And in that process, I am very delighted uh, to introduce our very own uh, Dr. Molly Apple, Assistant Professor of English, one of my favorite subjects. Uh, Dr. Apple, as the inaugural Be Bold Lecturer uh, presentation competition winner, congratulations to you, I'm so excited. Her presentation is entitled Words at Work, Literature as a Tool for Community Building and Social Justice. Uh, she will share the literary anthology, This Bridge Called My Back, Writings by Radical Women of Color. She will also showcase how Nevada State English majors put their study, the way that they are learning here at our institution, into this text, into action. And they're going to do that by talking about it through the pandemic and what that meant to them by developing a spinal column, uh, a magazine for those who believe in the liberation of our voice. Oh, that just gave me goosebumps. I love hearing that. Uh, some of the students, authors will also join her. Um, she is a Philly native, so uh, East Coast in the house, uh, who joined the Scorpion family in the fall of 2019. Uh, Dr. Apple worked as an academic and educator um, and has done so because it's deeply rooted in her praxis of literature, how literature and its readers shape our world. Uh, she specializes in Latinx and Latin American literatures, particularly the ways in which these narratives shape our understandings of human rights and the social justice movements of our time. At Nevada State College, Dr. Apple has taught courses in composition, human rights and the world literature, uh, Chicana X literature and the literature of migration, a theater of the Americas, oh, that sounds a great class to take, and an advanced seminar in the writings of Gloria Anzadula. I'm sure I didn't say that right, but you can correct We're me. so please. close, it was great. Uh, Thank you. Uh, prior to pursuing her doctorate in comparative literature, she worked as a K-12 ESL teacher in New York City and supported ES ELA uh, teachers in New York City and supported teachers as well in Philadelphia. Uh, again, I am profoundly grateful uh, to be the recipient of this moment to be here with you. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Dr. Apple, and look forward to learning with you and from you in this experience. Thank you so much, uh, President Pollard. It's it's a surreal uh, opportunity to be here, to be speaking with my community here in a room by myself, but knowing that I'm not actually by myself. Um, and I'm gonna get started. And so thank you again, as uh, President Pollard said, I'm Dr. Molly Apple, and I have the great privilege of being an assistant professor here at NSC. And I am so excited today because I get to talk to you all about my very favorite question. What is the point of literature? I'm completely serious. While many people enjoy writing fiction or poetry or even just reading it, Literature isn't always the first thing that comes to mind when a person is looking to pursue something that can change the world. We often think of literature as something ornamental or engaging with it as something peripheral or even self-indulgent. But it's a fair question that I really do love to ask. What exactly does literature do in the world? And I'm gonna tell you a story today. Once I get my slides up, here we go. Yeah, so I'm gonna be telling you a story today about how literature works as a tool for community building and for social justice. And specifically, I'm gonna tell you the story of This Bridge Called My Back and Spinal Column. But before, we dive into my story. I wouldn't be a good English professor if I didn't say, we have to start with a definition of our terms. So what do we mean when we say justice or social justice? 
often when we talk about justice, we're thinking about it in terms of recompense or recrimination as a kind of zero sum game based on legal terminology played out between perpetrators and victims. Nation states, courts, and laws tend to be the spaces that we turn to in defining and enacting justice. But within the past few decades, political theorists like Arturo Escobar and Nancy Fraser have argued that these traditional notions of justice fail to capture what is fully at stake in social struggles and conflicts. And I would say, that the popularization of the term social justice as distinct from justice is another indication of this failure. So Nancy Fraser has written that theories of justice must become three-dimensional, incorporating the political dimension of representation alongside the economic dimension of distribution and the cultural dimension of recognition. And the story that I'm going to be telling you today will show how in the hands of readers and writers, literature does this work of justice. And I'm taking this from the very brilliant insights of Nicholas Hengen Fox and applying it to this bridge called my back and the work that my students have done. And so these are those three ways. Literature represents and amplifies the voices of those who are ignored or demeaned. Literature engages in redistribution both materially through access to resources, to helping facilitate access to resources and to opportunities, and immaterially through linguistic and cultural recognition. And finally, literature builds understandings of existing power structures and empowers others to take action for equity by enabling real coalitions and communities to come together and redefine the terms on which others define them. So our story begins around April of 1979. Now, this was the moment in the 20th century in which institutions of all kinds had begun to haltingly put into practice the calls to action of the self-determination movements of the long 60s. So of course, the black civil rights movement of that time was one of a part, one part of a global coalition of self-determination efforts. And these efforts included the Chicano movement, indigenous rights and Palestinian liberation, the women's and gay rights movements in the United States and global student movements and decolonization efforts like the one in Mexico, as you see on my slide here, that was made infamous on the Plata Loca Plaza, but that's another story. Now, 10 or 15 years into the development of these movements, some of their deep-seated issues of misogyny and paternalism were really, really showing. Women of color began pushing back on the way that their experiences were made to be invisible in service of the supposed liberation of the greater whole. Among white second wave feminists, women of color were essentially told, let's take care of women's liberation first, then we'll worry about women of color. This meant, of course, that the idea of woman became rhetorically synonymous with white woman, rendering the identities and experiences of women of color invisible. So in 1979, two women bonded because they were the only Chicanas in a national feminist writers organization. These women were Jerry Moraga and Gloria Ansaldúa. They decided to address the patterns of racist and elitist practices that this absence illustrated. They started working on the book project that would become This Bridge Called My Back, writings by radical women of color. In their call for contributors, this is what they wrote as their call for folks to send them their writing. We want to express to all women, especially to white middle-class women, the experiences which divide us as feminists. We want to examine incidents of intolerance, prejudice, and denial of differences within the feminist movement. 
we intend to explore the causes and sources of, and solutions to, these divisions. We want to create a definition that expands what feminist means to us. Now, I want to encourage us to think about this call for cont contributions in terms of Nancy Fraser's definition of justice. We see here representation of absent voices within these movements. We see redistribution of access to institutional power and to the very terms of language. And we see recognition of difference in identity and experience. So what came together was a collection of the voices of over 20 of some of the foremost, um, some of the foremost writers and poets of their time, including Audre Lorde, Tony K. Bambara, Jenny Lim, Christos, Barbara Cameron, Rosario Morales, Nellie Wong, among others. They wrote about language, about education, their mothers, their lovers, about their sexuality, their spirituality, their heritage, and did it in a way that refused the very terms of their refusal in these discursive spaces. And because they refused to adopt this idea of the separation between poetry and experience and political and lived reality, community transformation was acted out and practiced through literary transformation. Now, I want us to look at how this actually works in the collection. And so we are going to look at the titular poem of the collection, The Bridge Poem. And I'm going to play um, Donna Kate Russian actually reading the poem with her own voice. And you may hear a few differences in from what um, what she's reading from the words that are published on the page and the words are coming from the fourth edition of the collection. Um, this difference illustrates both the ongoing process of revision that Russian uh, went through and, and all of the women writers of this anthology would constantly be adopting that process, um, as well as a kind of acknowledgement of how Russian had to adapt, again, her own words for different audiences. So I'm going to read, have her read this poem, and we'll follow along on my slides. The Bridge Poem. I've had enough. I'm sick of seeing and touching both sides of things. Sick of being the bridge for everybody. Nobody can talk to anybody without me, right? I explain my mother to my father, my father to my little sister, my little sister to my brother. My brother to the white feminist, the white feminist to the black church folks, the black church folks to the ex-hippies, the ex-hippies to the black separatists, the black separatists to the artists, and the artists to the parents of my friends. Then I've got to explain myself to everybody. I do more translating than the UN. Forget it. I'm sick of filling in your gaps, sick of being your insurance against the isolation of your self-imposed limitations, sick of being the crazy at your holiday dinners, the odd one at your Sunday brunches. I am sick of being the sole black friend to 34 individual white folks. Find another connection to the rest of the world something else to make you legitimate, some other way to be political and hip. I will not be the bridge to your womanhood, your manhood, your humanness. I'm sick of reminding you not to close off too tight for too long. Sick of mediating with your worst self on behalf of your better selves. Sick of having to remind you to breathe before you suffocate your own fool self. Forget it, stretch or drown, evolve or die. You see, it's like this. The bridge I must be is the bridge to my own power. I must translate my own fears, mediate my own weaknesses. I must be the bridge to nowhere 
but my own true self. It's only then I can be useful. Now, in literary analysis, we never just look at the content of the words on the page. We certainly start there, but we never just end there. We also look holistically at how a piece employs aesthetic and rhetorical strategies that help to shape our processes of listening and meaning making. So I'm gonna indulge in doing a little bit of close reading with all of you live right here. And we're gonna see if the tech agrees. I believe that it will. On our little Google Jamboard here, shout out to the amazing poet and teacher to be, Liz Galvez for introducing me to Google Jamboards. So I'm gonna look at just these, uh, sort of the first half of the poem, these beginning stanzas here, and start by just looking at what is standing out to me. And of course, part of what stands out immediately is these refusals over and over. I've had enough, um, forget it, I'm sick of it. And we also hear how she is describing the different demands of speech, the demands of bridging that are made upon her and the emotional and intellectual labor that it takes. I think this stanza stands out to me in particular. I explain my mother to my father, my father to my little sister, my little sister to my brother. And each group or community is also demanding specific conventions of her in an unending chain, an, a chain that uh, I even had to, I couldn't even keep up with in my own breath to vocalize it. But this unending chain is broken by each of these refusals, starting at the very beginning with I've had enough and proceeding not only with other um, refusals explicitly, but refusals to follow the conventions of these demands, the conventions of standard grammar. The other thing that I really notice here is how her words and other aspects of this poem direct us to her physical body, which is important because it gives us an idea of how this bridge that she's talking about is not just a metaphor, it's not just rhetorical, it's physical. One of the key ways I see this is the repetition of the word certainly something that we've all been facing that are not just in her words. One of the tricks that we see here um, is that when a line of poetry goes over uh, in a full sentence, but is broken up by the spacing of the page, this is called enjambment. And it gives us the sense of somebody pausing, almost being out of breath and exhausted. Nobody can talk to anybody without me, right? And so with this, when we look at the shape of the poem as a whole, and we see how she visually slows down in her refusals, right? We see this long um, chain of language And the way that this stanza takes up down in each of her refusals. So when we look at all of this taken together, something that we see that this poem is showing us is not just the words, the refusals that are present, but the words and refusals that are not being said, the words that are, exist in the negative spaces of her language of her experience. Nobody can talk to anybody without me, right? There's a presence and an absence. 
existing intention at the same time here. And so what I see happening is how this poem really embodies a performance of refusal of the terms on which the speaker is being recognized. And we as her audience sit with that refusal. So here we go. I'm back. <laughs> so some folks might hear my reading of this poem and even just read this poem and think, oh, wow, I'm white. So I don't really see myself in this poem and therefore it's not really worth my time to engage with it. Or they might think, you know, this is a really divisive perspective and it's actually causing more racism than it is helping us understand racism. And I would say that if that is the case, then you haven't done your close reading yet and you haven't practiced truly listening. What you can see is that when we apply the methodology of literary analysis, we see how teaches us how parents, and that is the bridge that this poem builds. The ability to build connections across difference without assimilating or erasing that difference is the core skill of, so of social justice work. The realization of the work of any kind of justice, social, political, environmental, requires the capacity to imagine other futures, other kinds of representations, other worlds. We need to be able to imagine beyond our experience, to connect beyond our experience, especially in the face of dissonance and contradiction with our own. Literature trains our imaginations for this by inventing new vocabularies for experiences, new ways to even structure our very thought process, even while it connects us to a long genealogy of those whose past imaginings have made our current lives possible. Without this capacity to pursue the limits of our times, Literature is both our technology for and our teacher of the future. And this is precisely what the editors and authors of this bridge called my back saw within the work that they were doing. In her introduction to the fourth edition of this bridge called my back, Cherry Moraga reflects on the work of justice in this context. She writes, it is not always a matter of the actual bodies in the room, but of a life dedicated to a growing awareness of who and what is missing in that room. And responding to that absence, what ideas never surface because we imagine we already have all the answers, she writes. And similarly, Gloria Ansaldúa would go on to write in her stunning work, which is posthumously published, Light in the dark, she would go on to develop this idea by saying intimate listening is more productive than detached self-interest, winning arguments, or sticking to pet theories. I think that perhaps the most extraordinary thing about this bridge called my back is how a vision for its own future, one beyond what even these authors saw in front of them, that is at the heart of this work. They write in the introduction, with the completion of this anthology, a hundred other books and projects are waiting to be developed. We see the book as a revolutionary tool falling into the hands of people of all colors. Finally, tenemos la esperanza que this bridge called my back will find into our family's lives. The revolution, curricula, syllabi,
community organizations, teach-ins, policy. Now, I know that I am extremely convincing, but you would be fair to ask, how do we know? How do we know that this book does all of the things that you're saying that it does? And one answer, once I get to it on the slide, here we go. One answer to this question of how do we know that this is how literature works is in my students ingeniously titled digital magazine, Spinal Column. And I believe that they'll be able to share a link to the digital magazine directly um, in the chat or somewhere else on this amazing Zoom platform. Now in the fall of 2020, a year ago, I taught a course writing about literature, which is a required class for English majors and minors. And while we did address the conventions of close reading in various literary genres, we really focused our studies on why people write about literature and the different kinds of opportunities and impact the different modes of writing about literature can have. I chose this bridge called my back as the anchor text in this course because I thought it was a powerful showcase of the diversity of forms that both literature and writing about literature can take. But as our semester progressed, it was clear that we all found as much inspiration in this bridge's model of coalition building across difference and distance as we did in the urgent words of its authors. After closely examining this publication completely of their own impetus from start to finish. With the creation of Spinal Column, these student authors established a new model for how to build coalitions among educators, learners, texts, and audiences in the middle of a global pandemic that has exacerbated the existing structural violences of white supremacy. And with it, the absent voices, stories, and bodies among us. This bridge that they built is, to borrow Ansaldúa's words, an act of healing that we desperately needed and still need today. But in the immortal words of the great LeVar Burton, you don't have to take my word for it. Hi, everyone. Good on. I'm Veronica King. I'm one of the contributors to Spinal Column and um which is a website or a web magazine based off of our inspired work from this bridge called my back um, what i learned about studying this bridge called my back was uh, how much of an emotional interpretation and perception people can get from studying um different powerful work like that i learned more insight into my own feminism and my own cultural beliefs i learned to have more pride in myself and I learned the impact that that pride can do. Um, so that was kind of my inspiration in the work that I provided for Spinal Column. I think that it really helped me kind of verbalize and shape my feelings and my own emotional reactions from what I read. Um, I contributed an informative piece, a close reading on one of the, um, one of the writings in this bridge called my back and i also helped upload and kind of format everything onto the weebly website since me and my partner had previously worked with weebly before um what i hope that it inspires other people is just to kind of the same as me just to kind of educate yourself on your own cultural like things that you identify with i guess because even though somebody feels like they like they know everything it is to be a Chicano or to be a woman because, well, if we are women, we are Chicanas, why wouldn't we? Um, you can always learn more and you can always kind of look at the history behind it and um, all that interesting stuff. You can 
add to your perceptions and add to your, your information that you think you have. Um, I hope that makes sense. I am going to read to you my favorite contribution, which is from my classmate, Janet Mora. She wrote a poem called Esta Flor, Esta Flor Florece. And my favorite stanza that stuck out to me and got a really strong emotional reaction out of me was uh, the second stanza. It says, uh, Mama, abuela, tía, mi hermana, bendita tú eres entre todas las mujeres, de piel morena, de piel color a mi tierra, colondrina libre del cielo, hija mayor del sol y heredera de la luna. Um, I just thought, I mean, that speak piece speaks for itself. And I just love that uh, she incorporated a really um, important prayer in the Hispanic culture, especially uh, the Catholic Hispanic culture. And I thought that it was just really great that she included um, calling out other women, the women that came before. For her and I guess the women that are with her um, says, you know, we're all amazing. So I just thought that was a really cool piece. And thank you, Jeanette, for sharing that with us. And thank you to all my classmates for contributing with me to me, and especially Dr. Apple for inspiring us and teaching us and um, helping us shape what we learn in class. So I hope you like it. Thank you so much. This is Jamie Rogers, uh, co author of the digital magazine Spinal Column. I I personally learned from this bridge to call my back to be more emotionally vulnerable and personal with my writing. I find that this was also a very similar learning experience for a lot of the other students in the class and how they were, how empathizing with the struggles and raw experiences of the authors of the original anthology of this bridge called my back uh, we were able to really dig deep into ourselves and in order to analyze the work brought to us and create our own art i wrote the uh, analysis of the essay for the color of my mother titled color Colors, Mouths, and Mothers. Uh, while doing so, I analyzed the uh, symbolic and structural choices made by the co-author Sherry Moraga. And I analyzed the uh, deliberate nature of her writing structure and the uh, word choices and how she describes her uh, mother as a woman of color and how she connects with the La Latino community and the, the women within it. Well, I very much hope that this magazine uh, has a similar effect that reading this br bridge had on us and that better yet, it may expose the anthology to a new audience. We've found that this anthology and working on this magazine really helped us to uh, bond and work together during quarantine. And, and that hopefully this story and these and the artistic pieces of literature within uh, this anthology will inspire people similarly. Thank you. Studying this bridge called My Back taught me a lot about perspective. Reading all of the different viewpoints of all of the women in this anthology and all of the things that they've been through and all of the different types of people that they are showed me that none of us are alone in this world and that we all can connect to each other in some way shape or form and just because you know someone doesn't mean you know what they've been through and i think that especially with a lot of what's going on in the world we all kind of forget perspective 
and even if we all go through similar things, we don't experience them in the same way. And I think that just taking a second and thinking about where someone comes from and just remembering that you don't know everything about a person can really help us all come together and understand one another in better ways than we do and I think that that's effort that we should all apply to our daily lives and that's definitely something that this anthology taught me. Um, when we were making our online magazine spinal column I helped to kind of look over and not necessarily edit other people's pieces for the magazine per se I just kind of looked over them and maybe gave a few suggestions to them not about what they should change but just about like maybe some grammatical things or places where I wanted to hear more of what they had to say and on top of that I also um, wrote my own piece for the magazine. It was um, a scholarly essay on lesbian feminism that I spent a lot of time on and really um, enjoyed writing. And I hope that our magazine can teach people perspective because not only did studying the anthology do that for me, but also writing a piece for this magazine and reading pieces from all of my peers that contributed to the magazine um, really showed me how different we all are but in our differences we're all kind of connected and kind of the same and just being able to recognize that me and all my peers all come from different places and that we all experience things differently really I think makes our magazine what it is and I think that we all approached the magazine and the work that we put into it in different ways and I think that that's part of what makes it such um, an eclectic work and something that I'm really proud of at least <laughs> because it, it is full of such different pieces and different perspectives and since we produce something that really shows what we all learned from reading the text. Kate Russian's um, poem called To Be Continued. Now whenever I get uptight, I remember what she told me. Keep moving, keep breathing, stop apologizing and keep on talking. When you get scared, keep talking anyway. Tell the truth like Sojourner Truth. Spill all the beans. Let all the cats out of the bags. If you are what you eat, you become what you speak. If you free your tongue, your spirit will follow. Just keep saying it. Girl, you'll get whole. Say it again and again. Girl, you'll get free. If you are what you eat, you become what you speak. Free your tongue and your spirit will follow. Free your spirit. No telling what could happen. Ooh, I'm going to bring this to a close by way of thank you, by the way, to Veronica and Jamie and um, Allie, who had an opportunity to submit that. And I know our other authors um, uh, wanted to connect. And, and for various reasons, we were all still in a, in a global pandemic. But in any case, I'm going to return to my favorite. What is the point of literature? Acting a different way of life. In poetry is not a luxury. Audre Lorde wrote, our hopes and dreams towards survival and change are first made into language, then into idea, then into more tangible action. So the question that this bridge called my back and spinal column leave us with is this. How will you train your capacity to imagine other worlds by sharing your story and listening, truly listening to the stories of others? What bold new blueprint for the future will you create by doing so? 
Gloria Anzaldúa told us that the task of remaking ourselves and our cultures is in our hands. And I would just add humbly that it is quite tangibly in the words in our hands. Thank you so much for listening today. I, I, I am uh, more than certain that uh, our colleagues are giving you a wonderful round of applause Amali, for what <laughs> you have done, as well as to your students, uh, to hear yes. you speak so thoughtfully and intentionally about the art and the science and the passion of understanding what the, the revolutionary, potentially a revolutionary act of literature, both as a noun and a verb. Uh, I, I love that. So I, I want to celebrate you in this moment. Uh, I'm going I to make add sure before you go on just to I forgot to mention this that we do have I do have two of our student authors with us in uh, our Q&A panel today we have Allison Bowler here with us and Blakely Campbell and so I just wanted to make sure to give them a round of applause as well and um, you know they're co-presenters with me in this and I'm, I'm eager to hear from them as well so thank well, you. Thank you, Dr. Apple. What I would love to invite and just tell people the uh, Q&A function is open, so please uh, feel free to engage in, in sharing questions. Uh, I have several uh, ideas that I've been uh, writing down as I was listening and, and want to make sure I'm responsive to that. I do know that we had one, uh, one of our colleagues was so grateful uh, to you for what they're listening and hearing and really wanted to know if we'd have access to your slides afterwards and perhaps we can start a canvas page which i love be inspirational lectures uh, i think this is phenomenal yes 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 so i think that would be great and this is a phenomenal one to start off with and you'll also see some wonderful shout outs and gratitude to you uh, for this you know I, I was struck and i'll pose i'll start off with my own questions or just observations and um, I, I want to ask you maybe if I could just ask a personal question to start off with, Molly, because what I loved in this when you talked about the bridge is my back and, and, and literally uh, how and why you chose this, all I kept thinking about was that uh, movie Brown Sugar. I don't know if you watched the movie Brown Sugar, but there's a, a question in there where the um, uh, main character poses to that she was a writer and she asked this question she wrote about music and she says, when did you fall in love with hip hop? And, and it was a great question. It kind of, it was this connective thread throughout the entire movie. So I, I'm gonna ask you um, in a similar thread, when did you fall in love with literature? Because I, I think there is something very special about folks like us uh, who love literature. And I'd love to invite you in, uh, to share some perspectives about when you, fell in love or what, what piece made you fall in love with literature? Because I think once you understand that, um, it starts to inform for you uh, where you are. And I'm, gonna, and, and I'm gonna model that if I can um, and, and give you time to think about it because I didn't tell you I was gonna ask that question. Um, there was this poem by Lucille Clifton that I love and it, it struck very similar to the piece that you read earlier called Won't You Celebrate With Me? And I had to read this when I was, I, I think, a undergrad, I may at that point started off undergrad as a poli sci major, and I went and changed over to English, but she says very quickly, won't you celebrate with me that I have shaped <clears throat> what I have shaped into a kind of life. I had no model, born in Babylon, both non-white and woman. What did I see except myself? I made it up here on this bridge between sunshine and clay, one hand holding tight, my other hand, Come celebrate with me that every day something tried to kill me and has failed. Mm. That's when I fell in love with literature because it reminded me of that great anthology that of women's literature that talks about and it starts off all the women are white and all the men, all the blacks are men, but some of us are brave. And there was a space where my story could resonate. When did you fall in love with literature, Molly? Oh my God, what a delicious question that I've actually never asked. I would say.
think I'll I'll share two moments. Um, and it's funny because I believe I'm enthralled with stories of other worlds. So I did a lot of watching Star Wars. I did a lot of um, reading different mythologies, uh, and I and that sort of. enthralled with storytelling every moment I would always ask my dad so much fascination with you know the <laughs> the sort of pseudoscience self-help of Joseph Campbell um, going down that road and that led to also flipping around a lot of different majors in college including mm -hmm. anthropology and psychology and Spanish literature and English literature and then I ultimately made up my own major in mythology and folklore um, and that led to comparative literature. And so I think that that, that sort of love of, of stories of worlds and communities and, and that sort of global sense was there. But I think I have to say, particularly into connection to this, I truly was um, floored, we could say, fell in, fell in love in the sense of being knocked on the floor mm -hmm. with the words of Gloria Anzaldúa mm -hmm. when I was in college and read Borderlands, La Frontera yeah. for the first time. Yeah. Um, and had never been, I think, had never seen a literary work that so insisted on being, taking its own path, on yeah. being itself yes. in terms of the language, in terms of what kind of genre I'm going to write in poetry, I'm going to write in personal history. And that personal history blends in with uh, standard and traditional and colonial and decolonial histories. And I, it completely shifted um, everything that I thought that I knew about what, mm. what storytelling was and how it looked like. And, and along with, obviously, you know, I did not share uh, her background precisely in the same sense, but I saw so many different, I saw my experiences, my thoughts, my struggles, my tensions articulated on the page um, in a way that just, um, I could never go back. And I've been learning from that text and from Gloria Ansaldúa and her colleagues uh, since then. Mm. So over, over 15, 20 years, oh my God, how old am I? When did I graduate college? <laughs> I'm an English professor, not a math professor. That's right. but, but, but Molly, but I, I love your point because you know what Bell Hook says is that people resist by telling their stories. Okay. So this idea, I love the verb you use there, insisted. It wasn't that they that they they needed to know, but there was an insistence there that I thought was powerful. Uh, one of your colleagues asked in the questions, which you know, and, and which I think is really, really important. And she says that at one point in your talk, you mentioned that some listeners or readers uh, may be responding with indifference or defensiveness and should consider going back to do a close reading because uh, she was so moved by the way she felt inspired by you doing that close reading. The other thing I thought was interesting in your close reading, just an aside, uh, if you actually th uh, visibly look at the text, it looks like a bridge, which I thought yes. was <laughs> interesting. Um, <laughs> but going with your point, she says, have you encountered um, this with students and how do you approach helping them wrestle with the text when they may be indifferent or defensive uh, in that reading? How, how do you grapple with that? Because that can obviously translate not only just in reading literature, but any type of reading that may make them uncomfortable um, as they're learning. I'll let you respond to that. I mean, I what a great question. And I think I'd also be curious to hear from Ali and Blakely from the student perspective in terms of whether they've, when they've encountered that, or even if they've seen how that happens when they're in a, in a classroom discussion with their colleagues. And, and something I guess that I've started to work on as, as, a, as an educator, you know, invested in these issues and in, in um, what anti-racist pedagogy we can say looks like is really thinking about down low, down low, I don't know, <laughs> at the core, right? What right. are the skills, what are the actual skills involved in engaging in 
anti-racism or engaging in um, reading a text that is igniting something in you that you don't recognize yourself in, which right. is sort of counter to the way we're kind of trained to think about how to read literature, which is a whole other talk, right? On the history of the novel and like the Bildungsroman is like the idea of the protagonist is somebody who you recognize yourself in. Right, 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 What right. does it mean then to, rec to not recognize yourself? Right in a protagonist, but still be with them. And so something that I emphasize or try to emphasize in different ways in the assignments and structures of my courses is to help students train themselves in the skills that I think are required for doing that effectively, which involve self-reflection, dialogue, um, and kind of critical, distancing in some way, holding, holding, sitting with tension, basically. These are all skills that are learned, right? Yes, and yes. they are skills that need to be purposefully taught. because they are not, um, forces us to kind of train our minds in a very different way, right? We have to resolve tensions. We have to solve things rather than kind of listen and sit with them. And listening is a skill. And so a kind of roundabout way to like kind of begin to answer that question is, is I think very explicitly and purposefully about training students in those skills of self-reflection, dialogue, building community guidelines, all of these kinds of things, so that inevitably, when attention arises, that they're a bit more equipped to have strategies to know what to do with that mm -hmm. and to know what that indicates, right? And so that's kind of a, a long way of doing it. I'm going to give a shout out to um, my colleague, Laura Decker, who uh, approached me in starting the Anti-Racist Pedagogy Collective last summer. And we're, I think they're having a, like a quick meeting after this <laughs> to sort of talk about this today, but we meet monthly and talk about questions exactly like that. And so we're very happy to have folks join. Well, you, that must've resonated because what another of our colleagues said, uh, you described a concept of connecting with the writing or experiences of others, even when you do not relate fully to these experiences. How can that skill be strengthened, which you answered? But I, I, I want to say, I think you're connecting uh, to a very powerful thread within uh, those of us who believe that uh, the very act of teaching is indeed a liberatory one. And the act of learning is also one where you have to experience the cognitive dissonance in order for deliberation to occur, right? So when I, when I, both of these points that our colleagues have raised are very important because, and you, I, I actually wrote it down when you said this, sitting with the tension, right? Because we, we I think as uh, in this particular time, we don't encourage that enough that you're supposed to be uncomfortable. You're supposed to experience the other and, and, and give host what did Parker Palmer say to the, yeah. to, the to the to the to the alien other? So I, I love this idea that really is resonating, and perhaps it's a whole another talk itself about definitely literature, <laughs> but also the act of teaching as helping students to sit with intent. Because perhaps you know this is Darian doing her own commentary here. Maybe this is what's the struggle with our country right now in a lot of ways that we do not know how to give host to the alien other yeah. and to sit with the tensions that come with that. And we've lost, if we ever had that skill, which I think is a pretty powerful one. I, I wanna make sure I, uh, you, you mentioned two of your students. Yes, Allison and Blakely are here. So Allison I would love to bring your voices in. I would love Great. to, <laughs> please feel free to jump in because you can see I just went, like I'm in graduate school, I'm all into this. <laughs> so, um, Allison or Blakely, would you all like to contribute to the conversation? Just unmute yourself and give us a perspective about how you see this from a student perspective. Ms. Blakely, hi. Hey, uh, uh, yeah, um, 
well, as Dr. Apple was even talking, I kind of was thinking about how, you know, especially with our professors, I'm specifically in the English department, since that is my major, of course, they have created a space for us to have the comfortability to talk about these topics. Mm. My professors have done an amazing job at providing us the room and space to talk with each other. I, in every class I've had, we've had either discussions or even like put us in breakout rooms if the class is too big. And so we have been taught to like sit with this tension and the way that I know for me, the way that I've been able to sit with this tension or something that has affected me or that I've read that I brought up emotions that I haven't been used to was being able to talk about those emotions with other people. Mm. Like how the piece like spinal column was like, we all have these emotions that we were trying to categorize and we were trying to understand that were new to us and inspiration that we took and we didn't know where to go. And by being able to talk with us, with each other, we understood that other people also had these tensions and these new emotions and these new responses. And so we were able to kind of put all these ideas together and go off of each other. And we had that space in Dr. Apple's class where we were just able to like talk all of us at for like periods of time, every time we read a new piece or every time we had a new question, we would all just take that time to understand each perspective which help us come to term with our own perspective and our own emotions towards that piece specifically. Mm. That, that's very powerful, this idea of, of giving you the space to really work through that, but have built the trusting environment where you're able to do that. It's interesting because one of our, uh, one of another folk, uh, one of our colleagues who commented in the Q&A talked about this idea that um, they particularly enjoyed this talk and your comment, Blakely, really responds to this. Uh, sharing a powerful quote that has new meaning for me, given the role social media plays in our everyday lives. I am what I am, and you can't take it away with all the words and sneers at your command. And what I think is really interesting about this is that is, you know, we kind of live in these almost uh, dual, dual existences, you know, very, very postmodern to a certain extent, as I think about this. But, you know, on one hand, we have the social construct, the social media allows us to create about ourselves. You know, you know, either we're all very happy people, we're all very well connected and we live fabulous lives. Or on the other hand, we all are really messed up in the head and we've got some other issues, right? So you kind of have these duality existences that really creates this false narrative and yet, but where do you grapple with it, right? This is why I love your observation of that's what good teaching in the classroom is about. And I love to hear the English folks doing that, that you're creating an intentional space to kind of reconcile both of those points. Alice, I'm gonna let you have the last comment because we are at the end and this has been so good. You can see I'm all into it. So go right ahead, Alice. <laughs> um, I was just going to kind of bounce off of what everyone else has been saying. I think that it's important to discuss not only with your peers, um, the things that we discuss in class, but I think also doing research yourself. Um, I think that oftentimes people will um, analyze literature just based off of the words on the page, which is which has its own value. But I think that if you research the time period it's from and the author that it's from and the experiences that birthed that work, I think that that also has a lot of its own value. And so when we were studying this bridge called My Back, we um, there's a bunch of different forewords and like introductions, and then there's like um, text after that just kind of explain the context of the book and all of the authors in it and how it all kind of came together. And I think that that was really beneficial for me in understanding um, all these different messages that were being told and all these different perspectives that were being shared. Um, and so I think that um, perspective, not only from my peers in classes, we would discuss these things all together and getting their perspective on the work, but also just um, having that conglomerative like universal perspective of like, okay, the authors themselves and then the people who are reading it and then the people who are teaching it, just kind of seeing yes. how it all kind of connects with each other. Oh, this makes me want to be in a classroom right now because this is the type of work that uh, is, is so powerful. So let, let me end by telling you, first of all, Dr. Apple, thank you so much uh, for lifting up that text, but talking about the potency of that text and helping students 
grapple with and uh, formulate their own voices. I, I celebrate you. This is inspiration. You can clearly see uh, it's inspiration to me. And then to these students, if they are representative of what good teaching looks like, uh, I pray that every student has this experience at Nevada State College. I want to thank you uh, for your uh, potency of what you've done here today, our colleagues uh, who joined in, and everyone who is a part of this wonderful experience. I can't wait to the next one uh, because this was certainly, and I want to encourage you to go out and get the spinal column and look at uh, these wonderful pieces by students. Read the book, This Bridge Called My Back. Go and sign up for a class with Dr. Apple, uh, all the kinds. And then when we get our Canvas page up and we actually put these lectures on here, go back. I think this would be a great professional development opportunity. Celebrate you. Thank you. Thank you all for the opportunity, for your voices, for listening today. It was the best. I needed this so much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank Everybody, you. thanks for joining and have a wonderful, wonderful day. Take care and be well.